Hello, this is Pastor Patrick Hines here at Bridwell Heights Presbyterian Church for another Pulpit Supplemental. And one of the projects that I wanted to do here on the program was to have a multi-part and multi-installment series um, of just reading through J. Gresham Machen's classic book, uh, Christianity and Liberalism. And Machen was um, the, the man who uh, was the founder of Westminster Seminary, broke away from Princeton long ago. You know, this is way back in the... Um, in the early 20th century, so the early 1900s. But I believe it was the year 1923 or 24 that he published the book, Christianity and Liberalism. And he picked that title that was very, very purposeful on his part. Because he wanted to communicate clearly and precisely that the liberal theology that had um, really taken over, uh, and to this day has taken over, and destroyed the mainline Presbyterian denomination in the United States, the PC USA, so, which is what it's called, um, which still has just shy of 11,000 congregations. It's many, many times bigger than even the PCA. Um, that the liberal theology really was just unbelief. Um, and as a matter of fact, Christianity is something entirely different from liberalism. And that is every bit as true right now today of progressivism uh, that you see in the in the PCA and in other reformed denominations that are, that's beginning to rot them out from the inside, um, as uh, was liberalism in Machen's day. Progressivism is not Christianity. In fact, that would be a good book project if I had the time um, to do a bunch of research and read a bunch of books that are coming out by the so-called you know conservatives in the PCA. You could write a book on um, uh, Christianity and progressivism and show that. Christianity, biblical Christianity, is a completely different religion uh, than progressivism, uh, which is sympathetic not just on the LGBT issues, but it's also sympathetic to the race uh, garbage with the critical race theory. Um, it's also uh, into um, ecumenism with uh, false religions like Catholicism, and, and th there will be other false religions coming along with it, too, eventually. Uh, but progressivism, the progressivism that um, was seen in the horrendous speeches at the PCA General, General Assembly uh, two summers ago. Um, that is a, re a reflection not of various perspectives in the PCA, but of complete apostasy. Uh, that was one thing. When I was on my uh, presbytery, former presbytery, thankfully, uh, Westminster Presbytery in the PCA, uh, th there are still a lot of good guys in that presbytery, don't get me wrong. I'm just very, very thankful to be out of the PCA. Um, because I don't want anyone to think that I'm in it, um, that I am in any way sympathetic to its agenda and to the things that it tolerates. But I, when I was on our Presbytery's Revoice Study Committee, uh, one of the things that I noticed immediately in when we had the talks of the Revoice Conference transcribed was the fact that there were Roman Catholic speakers at the conference. And I thought, you know, that itself is a chargeable offense. Um, you cannot put forward members of a false religion, no matter what they themselves say they believe. The fact that they're members in good standing of a false religion um, makes them not able uh, to, to preach and teach the truth as spokespersons for Christ because you're going to create all kinds of confusion uh, with that. And so um, I was pretty upset about that, but there, there was one individual on our committee that did not want us to include that fact in our report. He, didn't, he thought that pointing out that there were Roman Catholic speakers there was not within the purview of our of our task, which was to um, investigate the teachings of Revoice. I said it's totally relevant to our um, to our report. Not only because that they they are it's not just an isolated error on the homosexual issue, saying that there's a real that this is a real part of personhood or anything like that, but also uh, the fact that they evidently don't care. If someone is a member of a false religion, they're going to put them forward as a spokesperson for the gospel in front of their church. And they were teaching Roman Catholic doctrines. It was the Catholic, the Roman Catholic false doctrine of sin. That sin consists only in actions, not in desires and attitudes and things like that. And immediately, uh, when I saw that, that these were Roman Catholic speakers, it hit me. This is Catholic theology, too. This is the Roman Catholic doctrine of sin. Scripture defines evil thoughts and desires as sin. Okay, evil desires, it, wanting anything contrary to the law of God, whether you think you can help it or not, is not relevant. 
wanting anything contrary to God's law is itself sinful. Colossians 3, 5 says that. Kakos, evil. Epithumia, desires. Evil desires are sin. But anyway, um, it just shows you that progressivism is comprehensive uh, in its denial of the Christian faith. It will give lip service to it, just like the liberals did and still do today. And progressives give lip service to Jesus and to being Christ followers and things like that. They're not Christ followers. They're not Christians, and they don't believe the truth either. Now, that's going to make us unpopular for saying that, but I'm, I'm sorry it has to be said. Progressivism is not Christianity at all. Um, and if you want to see progressivism and all of its horror, uh, look at the uh, the podcast that I did going over that video. Someone compiled a video of, of the worst of the worst of the PCA General Assembly, and it was horrible. It was terrible. Go go listen to that podcast that I did where I reviewed those those awful, awful speeches that were made uh, at the PCA General Assembly. But what I would like to do, what I would like to do um, is go through... J. Gresham Machen's excellent book, Christianity and Liberalism, and I want to read it uh, in its entirety, if possible, and uh, really uh, get people to see that what we're dealing with here with regard to um, progressive Christianity is the same exact thing that Machen faced 100 years ago. It's not a different variety of Christianity. It's not, well, you know, maybe you guys should leave the denomination, or the PCA, and go somewhere else because you need, you know, something different. No, it's not that. It's that we left we left progressivism because progressivism is not Christianity. Progressivism does not understand the Bible or the gospel or sin or anything else. So I wanted to read this because the the, the relevance of Machen's book to the situation being faced now in conservative churches today, what, what's left of conservative churches in uh, the PCA, and I'm sure that the same sorts of things are going on in other denominations, um, is... It's comprehensively relevant because it's the same thing. It's the same exact uh, apostasy. So without any more ado, I want to get right to this. I'm going to start trying to do more videos and more podcasts um, that are shorter. Um, try to keep them about the half hour mark. But I'm um, going to go ahead and the introduction is excellent too. And uh, Machen, in fact, let me before we get into it, it's up here on the screen. The book is, is, um, is excellent. It goes through the main issues, the main uh, concerns related to Christianity. And what Machen's purpose is to show that Christianity and liberalism are mutually exclusive. They are not the same thing. Even though liberalism tries to say it's Christianity, it is not in any way, shape, or form. And that's why Machen wanted to make that contrast, Christianity and liberalism. So the first thing he does is he introduces the topic. Then he goes through um, the issue of doctrine in general, the issue of God and man. Very, very important. These aren't peripheral matters. These are the essentials of the Christian faith. The Bible Christ, salvation, and the church. So with no more ado, let's get right to the introduction here. Here's, here's what uh, this great man of God uh, who suffered greatly uh, at the hands of the liberals um, who uh, eventually got him excommunicated when every one of them had already excommunicated themselves uh, by apostatizing. They got him excommunicated uh, for disturbing the peace and for you know having the audacity to defend the deity of Christ and you know the Christian faith. Says Machen, introduction. The purpose of this book is not to decide the religious issue of the present day, but merely to present the issue as sharply and clearly as possible, in order that the reader may be aided in deciding it for himself. Brilliant. Just lay out the issues. Spell it out clearly. What is the controversy between the, the fundamentalist modernist or Christian and liberal? Um, what is the controversy about? Let, let the reader take a look at it and then decide for himself. <clears throat> Presenting an issue sharply is indeed by no means a popular business at the present time. Wow. I mean, he's saying this in 1923, 1924, I mean, between the world wars. I mean, we're coming up on this being almost a hundred years old. Okay? Um, for my part, presenting the issue of progressivism that was reflected in that, that god-awful conference, Revoice, um, presenting it sharply... Is indeed by no me is indeed by no means popular business at the present time, uh, Doctor Machen. It's not. It's still not popular um, at the present time. A hundred years later, and when was that? 2017, 2018. It's still not popular, and myself and others were viciously attacked by the the progressives in the Westminster Presbytery, and they know who they are. They know who they are. There are many who prefer 
to fight their intellectual battles in what Dr. Francis L. Patton has aptly called a condition of low visibility. <laughs> yep, low visibility. Clear-cut definition of terms and religious matters, bold-facing of the logical implications of religious views, is by many persons regarded as an impious proceeding. And just remember, that was 100 years ago. It's still considered an impious proceeding. I mean, we were attacked constantly for the tone. We don't like your tone. You guys are too passionate. Um, I, I wonder how those people would have reacted to almost everything Jesus ever said. Almost anything that the apostles preached and taught in public. You guys don't, uh, you guys are, are impious. You, you have too much passion. We don't like your tone. <clears throat> Machen says, may it not discourage cont contribution to mission boards? The, the thing is, what good is missions if they're spreading heresy? What good is the gospel that you're preaching if it's a false gospel? May it discourage con contribution to mission boards, all this theological wrangling and infighting? May it not hinder the progress of consolidation and poor, produce a poor showing in columns of church statistics? But with such persons, we cannot possibly bring ourselves to agree. Light may seem at times to be an impertinent intruder, but it is always beneficial in the end. The type of religion which rejoices in the pious sound of traditional phrases, regardless of their meanings, or shrinks from controversial matters, will never stand amid the shocks of life. In the sphere of religion, as in other spheres, the things about which men are agreed are apt to be the things that are least worth holding. The really important things are the things about which men will fight. Man, that is so, so, so true. Listen to that again. In fact, I'm going to... That, that deserves to be highlighted. In fact, it says here 155 people highlighted that too. So I'm going to highlight it here on my Kindle. That will show up in all my gadgets when I pull up this great book. The type of religion which rejoices in the pious sound of traditional phrases, regardless of their meanings, or shrinks from controversial, matter, ma controversial matters, will never stand amid the shocks of life. In other words, it, has, it doesn't have enough content or substance to it to sustain men against the trials of life. In the sphere of religion, as in other spheres, the things about which men are agreed are apt to be the things that are least worth holding. The really important things are the things about which men will fight. Exactly. Why was I willing to fight about calling homosexual desires sin? Because homosexual desires are sin. They've always been sin. They always will be sin. Regardless of the fact that many people just want to make an allowance for people to be gay, but, you know, a follower of Christ, and intrinsically, inherently lesbian or transgender, but still a follower of Christ, th those are fighting words. Because what you are, in fact, saying is that our God is not able to free people from slavery to sin. And I'm sorry, but he still is. And if you're not freed from slavery to sin, you're not a Christian. I'm not saying you don't struggle with sin. We all struggle with sin. But if you're willing to define yourself as a certain, certain type of sin, your, your ontology, your being as a type of sin, you can't know Christ. You don't know the, you don't know the Jesus I know. Um, you, you certainly can't. Machen continues. In the sphere of religion, in particular, the present time is a time of conflict. The great redemptive religion which has always been known as Christianity, is battling against a totally diverse type of religious belief, which is only the more destructive of the Christian faith because it makes use of traditional Christian terminology. See what he's saying? The liberals, they talked about Jesus all the time. You know, there was a, a guy, I think Robert Godfrey, um, I've heard him say that uh, in his seminary class on church history, he would make his students read sermons by Friedrich Schleiermacher, or he would maybe he would read excerpts from them out loud in class and ask them who preached this sermon, and they would they thought it was you know a great Christian evangelist, and then he would tell them it was Friedrich Schleiermacher, a guy who didn't believe anything in the Bible, who was a total liberal, who applied Immanuel Kant's um, skeptical philosophy to Christianity. What well, why did it sound like it was evangelical? Why did it sound like it was biblical? Because they used the same terms that we do. And you have to really dig to find out what they mean. Machen continues here. This modern, non-redemptive religion is called modernism, or liberalism. 
Both names are unsatisfactory. The latter, in particular, is question-begging. The movement designated as liberalism is regarded as liberal only by its friends. Good, a good point. To its opponents, it seems to involve a narrow ignoring of many relevant facts. And indeed, the movement is so various in its manifestations that one may almost despair of finding any common name which will apply to all its forms. He's right. You can't really say that this, this is liberalism or this is progressivism. It may have liberal and progressive factors in it. But I, I would maintain the thing that the tie that binds all forms of progressive and liberal Christianity, well, if you even want to use the word Christian, pseudo Christianity, all forms of Ludo and or of <laughs> Ludo, pseudo uh, and liberal Christianity, pseudo Christianity, the thing that binds them all together is unbelief. They don't believe the Bible. Oh, oh will they tell you that? No, of course not. They, they would say they, they hold to the scriptures as the word of God. What do they mean by word of God? Well, it becomes the word of God existentially, experientially, as we read it. It's not objectively the word of God. Of course, they might even try to say that, too. You have to really, really dig and listen carefully to expose liberals and progressives for what they are, which is really unbelievers. They don't believe. I remember R.C. Sproul did a lecture on liberalism, and he, he wrote up on the chalkboard, you want to describe liberalism in one word, here it is, and he wrote the word Unbelief in chalk on the board. Unbelief, he wrote and underlined it. What is liberalism? Unbelief. They do not believe God, and they don't believe the Bible. Okay, listen. And indeed, oh, oops. Uh, do, 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 do. But manifold as it as are the forms in which the movement appears, the root of the movement is one. The many varieties of modern liberal religion are rooted in naturalism. That is, in the denial of of any entrance of the creative power of God as distinguished from the ordinary course of nature in connection with the origin of Christianity. You see, he's right about that. Naturalism is the idea that there is no God and that religion arises from man's primordial instincts and man's sense of self-preservation, his need to come up with an answer to the unanswerable questions, things like that. It says Machen. The word naturalism is here used in, in a sense somewhat different from its philosophical meaning. In this non-philosophical sense, it describes with fair accuracy the real root of what is called, by what may turn out to be a degradation of an originally noble word, liberal religion. He's right. The word liberal just means free. Okay? We, in fact, uh, Calvin uses, uh, at least in the English translations of Calvin that I've read, they speak of God's liberality all the time. What does that mean? God freely gives us so many blessings to enjoy. Uh, God gives us wine that makes glad the heart of man, oil to make his face shine, it says in Psalm, I think it's Psalm 104. Um, th these are examples of God's liberality towards us. So, so the term liberal is actually a good word. Okay, It just refers to, to freedom and that sort of thing. So it's a good word, but it's, it's being misused. It's misused um, somewhat. Uh, liberal religion, meaning religion that's free from all constraints of Scripture is really what it's what it's getting at. Liberal in the sense that we don't hold to anything permanently. There are no permanent, fixed, or unchanging truths, except the truth that there are no unchanging, fixed truths that are revealed by God. Okay, says Major. The rise of this modern naturalistic liberalism has not come by chance, but has been occasioned by important changes which have recently taken place in the conditions of life. The past 100 years have witnessed the beginning of a new era in human history, which may conceivably be regretted. Now, just bear in mind, he's talking about 100 years prior to 1923. So from he's talking about the 19th century here, okay? Which may conceivably be regretted, but certainly cannot be ignored by the most obstinate conservatism. The change is not something that lies beneath the surface and might be visible only to the discerning eye, on the contrary, it forces itself upon the attention of the plain man at a hundred points. Modern inventions and the industrialism that has been built upon them have given us in many respects a new world to live, to live in. We can no more remove ourselves from that world than we can escape from the atmosphere that we breathe. Now, just keep in mind here, this is prior to, to the advent of, you know, computers and com communication technology that we have today and smartphones and the internet and everything else. So if, if his world was turned upside down by the industrial revolution, by the inventions of the 
19th century and early 20th century, how much more have our lives been turned upside down by the technology that we have? I mean, these smartphones and the, the TVs and the access to everything on the Internet has, has changed things even more. Machen continues, But such changes in the material conditions of life do not stand alone. They have been produced by mighty changes in the human mind. As in their turn, they themselves give rise to further spiritual changes. The industrial world of today has been produced not by blind forces of nature, but by the conscious activity of the human spirit. It has been produced by the achievements of science. The outstanding feature of recent history is an enormous widening of human knowledge which has gone hand in hand with such perfecting of the instrument of investigation that scarcely any limits can be assigned to future progress in the material realm. Wow, what, what would what would Machen have written if he had written this in 2023? I mean, everybody today thinks they know everything. They think they know everything already. The application of modern scientific methods is almost as broad as the universe in which we live. Though the most palpable achievements are in the sphere of physics and chemistry, the sphere of human life cannot be isolated from the rest. And with the other sciences, there has appeared, for example, a modern science of history, which, with psychology and sociology and the like, claims, even if it does not deserve, full equality with its sister sciences. No department of knowledge can maintain its isolation from the modern lust of scientific conquest. Treaties of inviolability, though hallowed by the sanctions of age-long tradition, are being flung ruthlessly to the winds. In such an age, it is obvious that every inheritance from the past must be subject to searching criticism, and as a matter of fact, some convictions of the human race have crumbled to pieces in the test. Indeed, dependence of any institution upon the past is now sometimes even regarded as furnishing a presumption not in favor of, but against it. So many convictions have had to be abandoned that men mu have sometimes come to believe that all convictions must go. <laughs> that's all, that's even more true today. I mean, I just I can't help but think of the the lunacy of so much of what was said on the other side of the debates about progressivism and the revoice and all this garbage going on in the PCA. The things that were said in presbytery meetings by men who are ordained and have divinity degrees was mind-blowing how dumb it was it's like you you're not allowed to have if you have convictions you are a fossil if you think that things are absolutely true to the exclusion of falsehood in its entirety you're an idiot just amazing he, he's right so many convictions have had to be abandoned that men have sometimes come to believe that all convictions must go if such an attitude be justifiable then no institution is faced by a stronger hostile presumption than the institution of the Christian religion, for no institution has based itself more squarely upon the authority of a bygone age. Man, he is exactly right. And that's the way it is today. The progressives, they don't even want to hear what the Bible says. They don't even care what the Bible says. You start quoting passages, look, Romans chapter 1 identifies the desires and the actions as sin. They don't care. They don't even, that has no effect on them. And Christianity, the Christian religion, is a religion of absolutes. It's a religion of revealed truth that is fixed and unchanging and is in no way affected by the zeitgeist of the age, by the, the spirit of the age in which we live. We live in an age of relativism, an age in which people think that, that if you have convictions that you hold to, that you are a hate monger, that you are a horrible person that you you aren't even a christian you don't you don't deserve the name christian if you think that that we ought to have convictions that we hold listen to that sentence again if such an attitude be this one right here so many convictions have had to be abandoned that men have sometimes come to believe that all convictions must be abandoned if such an attitude be justifiable then no institution is faced by a stronger hostile presumption than the institution of the Christian religion, for no institution has based itself more squarely on the authority of a bygone age. Exactly. We believe that what this book here says, what the Bible says, is true, remains true, whether the progressives in the PCA think it's true or not. Whether they can preach sermons that, that, people, that are horrible, just awful denials of Scripture, 
And other ministers stand up and say, that was the best sermon I've ever heard in my life. That was the greatest thing I've ever heard in my life. That was the most masterful analysis of the Bible and society that I've ever heard. Says Machen, we are not now inquiring whether such policy is wise or historically justifiable. In other words, we're not getting to the issue yet. In any case, the fact itself is plain. Christianity, during many centuries, has consistently appealed for the truth of its claims, not merely and not even primarily to current experience, but to certain ancient books, the most recent of which was written some 1900s, I'll contextualize it, some 20 hundred years ago. The most recent was written 2,000 years ago. To be a Christian, you have to believe that. What's true, in the ultimate sense, is what God has said in Scripture. If you don't believe that the Scriptures are what God has said, you are, by no stretch of the imagination, a Christian. By no stretch of the imagination. If you cannot be corrected by the Word of God, you're not a Christian. We were, my wife is on Facebook and was having a discussion with one of her, um, a friend from long ago, who is a flaming liberal progressive now. Gay is good. God, God doesn't discriminate ever. You have to wonder, what, what Bible do these people read? Well, they read the true Bible, the right Bible. They just don't care. They don't care what it says. I pointed out, you know, my wife wanted me to, to chime in on that discussion. I was like, okay, I haven't, haven't been in a Facebook war in many years and I'm not getting a Facebook account never will or Twitter or Instagram or who knows what else I don't even know what else is out there what they're called anymore um, and pointed out God discriminates constantly Jesus is a discriminating savior he discriminates people from heaven and sends them to hell and I pointed out 1 Corinthians 6 9-11 through do not be deceived do you not know that the unrighteous shall not enter the kingdom of God and it lists fornicators and idolaters and homosexuals and effeminate perverts her response was well those are the words of Paul no <laughs> it's like uh, Jesus said if you don't hear my apostles you don't hear me don't say you're one of my followers if you do not believe what my apostles inscripturated in the Bible but it's like well that was just Paul he who hears you hears me he who rejects you he who rejects the apostles rejects Christ. You are not a Christ follower if you do not believe what the apostles of Christ were guided by the Holy Spirit to write down in those ancient books. Now listen, Machen goes on, it is no wonder that that, that appeal is being criticized today for the writers of the books in question were no doubt men of their own age whose outlook upon the material world judged by modern standards must have been of the crudest and most elementary kind. Inevitably, the question arises whether the opinions of such men can ever be normative for men of the present day. In other words, whether first century religion can ever stand in company with 20th century science. And for us, 21st century science. However, the question may be answered. It, it presents a serious problem to the modern church. Attempts are indeed sometimes made to make the answer easier than at first sight it appears to be. Religion, it is said, is so entirely separate from science that the two, rightly defined, cannot possibly come into conflict. This attempt at, se at separation, as it is hoped in the following pages may show, is open to objections of the most serious kind. But what must now be observed is that even if the separation is justifiable, it cannot be effected without effort. The removal of the problem of religion and science itself constitutes a problem. For, rightly or wrongly, religion during the centuries has, as a matter of fact, connected itself with a host of convictions, especially in the sphere of history, which may form the subject of scientific investigation, just as scientific investigators, on the other hand, have sometimes attached themselves, again, rightly or wrongly, to conclusions which impinge upon the innermost domain of philosophy and of religion. For example, if any simple Christian of 100 years ago, or even of today, were asked what would become of his religion if history should prove indubitably that no man called Jesus ever lived and died in the first century of our era, he would undoubtedly answer that his religion would fall away. You hear that? The Christian faith, what makes it different, what makes it different from man's religions, is it is in principle falsifiable. If Jesus never lived, 
gig is up. I asked a youth group that question many years ago in 2007 when I was a youth director at a church in Mississippi. I asked them, based on 1 Corinthians 15, if Jesus of Nazareth did not live, die, and rise from the dead, would we still come to church? Ten out of twelve of those kids said, yeah. And I said, why? That would mean the whole thing is false. Well, we still need morals and things like that. Two of the kids there, two of them, said that would mean that everything we believe is false. And I said, exactly right. If Jesus was not a real person, if he did not leave footprints in the sand over there in Israel, if he did not actually die on a Roman cross, if he did not literally, physically, bodily rise from the dead, Christianity is not true. It is in principle falsifiable. If Jesus' body is ever found, Christianity is not true. Listen, Mason says, Yet the investigation of events in the first century in Judea, just as much as in Italy or in Greece, belongs to the sphere of scientific history. In other words, our simple Christian, whether rightly or wrongly, whether wisely or unwisely, has, as a matter of fact, connected his religion in a way that to him seems indissoluble with convictions about which science has a right to speak. If, then, those convictions, ostensibly religious which belong to the sphere of science, are not really religious at all, the demonstration of that fact is itself no trifling task. Even if the problem of science and religion reduces itself to the problem of disentangling religion from pseudoscientific assertions, the seriousness of the problem is not thereby diminished. Listen, from every point of view, therefore, the problem in question is the most serious concern of the church. What is the relation between Christianity and modern culture, May Christianity be maintained in a scientific age. Man, we need another Machen. And I, I put a, I highlighted that just so I know exactly where we left off, but I'm going to stop there. He's exactly right. He's exactly right. And this going through this book is going to be most useful because what he describes as liberalism of yesteryear in 1923 or 4 is progressivism in the PCA and wherever else it finds itself existing. It is the same exact thing. The sympathy towards other religions like Catholicism and whatever else, the the knuckling in on the homosexual LGBTQ issues. That's not an isolated little thing and they got everything else right. It is the encroaching of unbelief. It is the encroaching of real and what will end up being comprehensive apostasy from the gospel and from the true Christian faith. So I hope that you'll see that more and more as we go through Machen's book, and uh, thank you for watching or for listening.